Today we're talking about the best and worst movies of 2017 with reviewer Peter Canavese. Thanks for being here, Peter. Always a pleasure. Um, I think let's just dive in with yeah. a countdown of your top 10 favorite movies from 2017 uh, thus far. Wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, so um, um, among them is Lady Bird, which is uh, written and directed by Greta Gerwig. Um, and it's uh, one of the best mother-daughter stories, I think, that's been put on screen. It um, stars Saoirse Ronan as a teenage girl. That's the coming-of-age story. Thank you for pronouncing that for me, so I don't yeah, have to. Yeah, right? <laughs> and Laurie Metcalf plays her mother. Uh, there's more to the story, of course. Uh, there's a lot of things that it touches on, but really the core of it is the relationship between those two. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very believably constructed. Um, and heartwarming as well, uh, and funny. It's a you know, comedy drama. Uh, so that was a great film. Um, Nocturama is a movie probably not a lot of folks have seen. Uh, didn't get a, a hugely wide release. Um, it's a French film about uh, a group of millennial terrorists in Paris, uh, and uh, has a lot of interesting things to say about terrorism and the response to it and um, kind of the maybe the mental disconnect that it takes to be a terrorist um, and also uh, the hypocrisy that can be involved in being a terrorist and, and also living in the material world that you're trying to blow up. Um, so that had a, a nice satirical edge to it as well and it's a very stylish film and, and a gripping film, a very intense uh, kind of thriller sort of film. Um, France is a uh, film by Francois Ozone, the French filmmaker. I like the French this yeah. year. Uh, a lot of French <laughs> films. Uh, and it's set in, in the aftermath of, the, of World War I in Germany uh, and uh, partly in France as well. Um, and it's about, um, it's kind of a mystery, uh, so it's hard to say too much about it, but it's about a, a woman who, when she's visiting the grave of her dead lover uh, who died in the war finds a man leaving flowers on the grave and uh, what happens uh, from there and trying to kind of untangle uh, the relationships. That was one I didn't get to see that I wanted to see after reading the uh, review. Yeah, that's really uh, good. Is it, do you know if it's streaming? It's on home video and I assume streaming as well. Yeah, you can get it on iTunes and all that. Okay. Yeah. Um, the Lost City of Z is uh, an American film by James Gray, filmmaker James Gray. Uh, and it's about the explorer Percy Fawcett. It's a historical film, though it's uh, fictionalized a bit, uh, but it's uh, pretty much a historical film. Uh, and uh, he was exploring the Amazon, uh, had obsessively, it's not an obsessive search for this fabled lost city. And it's about that obsession, it's about kind of intergenerational relationships as well, is how he dealt with his father and how he's dealing with his son. Um, yeah, a lot of, again, interesting ideas there. And it's a spiritual kind of movie as well, strangely. Um, and again, a beautifully made film, uh, beautiful visually. Uh, I, Tanya is... Uh, Dying another, to see yeah, I, Tanya. Another domestic film, and it's, uh, it's about America. Um, it's about largely about the media, really, uh, and how the media shapes a story and how we view a story and how we end up remembering a story. It challenges us to re-remember the Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan uh, fiasco uh, and uh, kind of tells us the story in a way we, that we realize, oh, what I thought I knew about it isn't really how it unfolded. Uh, and it's also very funny. It's a really sharp uh, comedy. Uh, and Allison Janney is uh, especially good in it as the terrible stage mother of Tanya Harding. Uh, uh, Winter Olympics coming up soon. So. Yeah, right. Bone up with I, yeah. Tanya. <laughs> Hopefully there won't be any more disasters of that uh, caliber. Uh, the work is a documentary film um, about prisoners in Folsom Prison and this really amazing... 
uh, work that's being done, therapy work. Uh, they do these therapy workshops. And in the film, the prisoners um, meet with people from the outside who also have issues. They're, they, they, they're volunteering to join in this kind of therapy, and they all kind of deal with that therapy on the same level, right? So they, they, uh, there's no dividing line between them and the prisoners. And it's a really powerful look at, it's all men, too, uh, sort of the ways men have been conditioned in society to repress their emotions and then how those emotions come out through this therapy in a really kind of amazing way. Uh, so that's a documentary. Uh, the one documentary that made it onto my, uh, my top ten list. Um, BPM, is, uh, Beats Per Minute, is uh, another French film. Uh, and it's, uh, it's about Act Up Paris, the activist group um, protesting uh, government inefficiency in dealing with AIDS. Uh, and so there's a lot of history woven through that film, though it's also a fiction film. Uh, and again, very emotional and powerful, but also an interesting look at just how an activist organization like that functions. Um, a lot of it is kind of the nuts and bolts of, and the arguments, the debates, the meetings that take place where they're trying to decide how best to uh, bring awareness to the issue or how best to functionally protest against uh, you know, the government uh, and the pharmaceutical kind of... Um, in, in, in action. Um, a Quiet Passion is a film by the British filmmaker Terence Davies, uh, but it's about Emily Dickinson, and who's played uh, for the most part in the movie by Cynthia Nixon, who most people know from Sex and the City. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a great just uh, biopic of Emily Dickinson, but it's also a really interesting movie about uh, a woman who is fighting mightily against strictures, <laughs> the strictures of society at the time when she was living, um, sexism, of course, uh, and also uh, her health issues that she had to overcome. Uh, so a really interesting film there as well. And uh, Call Me By Your Name is um, uh, a gay sort of romantic drama of sorts, uh, though uh, you could argue whether it's a romance or not, but it's the story of uh, a 17-year-old American Jewish boy in northern Italy living with his family in northern Italy. Uh, they have a, kind of a vacation villa, and he falls for this 24-year-old uh, resident intern that works with uh, the father of the family. Uh, and it's really all about... The, that relationship and how it unfolds and uh, it's really attuned to the nuances of that step by step how the interest develops between these two and how they deal with that uh, it's obviously very complicated um, so yeah another interesting movie and it's also just a beautiful can travel yeah, on film it sounds like it's kind of one of those ones where the scenery is almost a character it is yeah yeah. I think that was what your only four star movie for this year. <laughs> well, no, for, uh, in the uh, weekly. Uh, yeah, for in, in the, the weekly. weekly. Yes, yeah. so far, wow. yeah, right. Uh, probably may won't be the last because uh, the year's almost out <laughs> here, right? Uh, and uh, the Florida Project is um, a movie by Sean Baker. He did Tangerine, the indie film, um, and this is another uh, very independent movie uh, about sort of the uh, lower echelon of society uh, economically and how they struggle to survive and thrive, but also the kind of, uh, sort of the joys and the pains of these characters. It's a, really told from the perspective of a bunch of kids, particularly one little girl played by Brooklyn Prince. She gives a, an amazing breakout performance. Uh, and uh, how her mother is trying to kind of make ends meet. They live in this run-down motel, um, and yeah, uh, just really successfully kind of tells the story on this kid level, but also asks you, challenges you to uh, ask yourself, is what I'm seeing kind of a good life? Is it a, a, a bad life? Uh, you know, should, 
should the kids be raised this way? Uh, yeah, really interesting story about a segment of the population that's usually ignored. Were there any movies on this list that you went into thinking, this is going to be horrible, and then completely surprised you? Uh, on this list? Yeah. Mm. Uh, or in no. general? Yeah, no, uh, I don't think so. I, I usually go in with a pretty open mind. I try, I try not to watch any trailers um, okay. or any you know, clips or footage in advance. I try to go in knowing as little as possible, usually. What about um, the opposite? Any disappointments? Um, I wonder, leaping to mind? <laughs> so I'm sure something will occur to me. There's no action films in your top ten. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, it, sometimes they, they eke in. They usually wind up in my runners-up list uh, more so than in my we, top ten. Can you 10. say a little bit about Get Out? Because I, I know you've I, seen it. I love it. I haven't movie. seen it, but I feel like it's the one of the most talked about right. films. Yeah, too. yeah, it's very, that's maybe the... One of the, yeah, as you say, one of the most talked about movies is a very zeitgeisty kind of movie. Um, it's a horror movie. Uh, it's very much a genre movie. Um, I think that kind of limits it a little bit. Um, and uh, it, it's a little gimmicky, uh, maybe, but uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I, I gave that one three and a half stars, too. It was one of my better reviewed films of the year. It's on my runner's up list. Um, but yeah, obviously, it deals with. Um, uh, it's from an African-American filmmaker, Jordan Peele. He's known from Key and Peele, the yeah. sketch comedy show. And he's, uh, it's a more or less serious movie, but it has a lot of humor to it as well. It's a satire on black-white politics at the moment. Yeah. Were you a fan? I was a fan. That was like the one movie I had to make sure I went to see. And, and then it came back on HBO and I watched it again. So, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I don't want to give it away, but it, it was, yeah. it's good. So now let's take a look at your bottom picks or movies uh -oh. to avoid. <laughs> oh, must we? Must we yes. revisit these movies? Um, yeah. Uh, well, one of them is uh, The Dark Tower, which is a Stephen King adaptation. That was a real disappointment, but uh, I kind of had a, I think I had a bit of a whiff on it already by the time I sat down to watch it, that it was not going to be very good. Um, and when you're choosing, you know, when you're, rating worst films, do you take into account like how big a budget they have and, and things like that, or is it? Well, yeah, I tend not to uh, stomp on you know, like micro-budget movies. Right. You know? <laughs> I, I don't want to you know, hit them when they're down, so to speak. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, this was a very big budget, probably the biggest budget movie on this bottom five list was The Dark Tower, uh, and it just was a total misfire. Uh, poorly written and almost near incoherent. <laughs> Uh, plotless, thrillless, too, for a movie that's supposed to be really exciting. It's just a, a big bore. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of a smaller scale movie was Unforgettable. It was a, a sort of uh, throwback kind of sexist uh, thriller <laughs> with the, uh, the spurned woman uh, trying to, you know, just going nuts and trying to take apart someone else's relationship. Uh, Catherine Heigl being the spurned woman. She's not exactly... Mm -hmm known for starring in uh, the artsiest films. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Geostorm was uh, Geostorm. of the uh, sort of Independence Day school. Uh, it's actually directed by uh, one of the makers of Independence Day, Dean Devlin, and it's just a colossally stupid uh, movie <laughs> about uh, uh, global climate change wreaking havoc on the planet and uh, things blowing up real good. Uh, but not very uh, entertainingly, uh, too stupid to enjoy. And uh, Father Figures, which I just saw this week, uh, is a really uh, unfunny comedy uh, starring Ed Helms and Owen Wilson as two guys on the search for their biological father. It's a sort of Mamma Mia uh, kind of thing. Uh, who's the real father? But, uh, ooh, painful. I did see the trailer before I saw that one, and it, it made it even more painful because it's one of those trailers that gives away every single beat yeah. of the movie where you see it. Uh, so was there was kidding. this inevitability to watching this. Oh, and yeah, now I'm going to see this part. Oh, now I'm going to see this part. What's the other one that I'm getting mixed up that also you didn't like very much with Mel Gibson? Oh, that Daddy's Home. Oh, Daddy's Home too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was also not much of a winner. Uh, yeah. Not a good year for, for daddy movies. Yeah. Movies, <laughs> daddy issues. 
Uh, and then American Assassin, uh, which was just uh, uh, kind of a meathead action movie, uh, macho. I could uh, feel your pain when I was reading your review of that. <laughs> that was one of my favorite uh, reviews that I read from you this year. <laughs> yeah, those reviews tend to be really evocative of, of, uh, of my pain. <laughs> it kind of pours out in the writing. What, do you, um, did you have a favorite review that you just in wrote? Pleasure of writing. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, probably uh, A Dog's Purpose, which nearly made my worst list, and it's probably the one I would uh, you know, get a lot of hate for because people love dogs. But I say in the review, you could love dogs and you can hate this movie. It's okay uh, because it's, you know, it's a really dopey movie. <laughs> Now, I noticed Star Wars didn't make it in any of your lists or categories, but you gave the movie good reviews, so what is going on there? Oh, uh, it just, uh, you know, all the movies on my runners-up list uh, would probably, you know, have the same rating. Of three okay. and a half stars. There's a lot, of, a lot of movies that I thought were excellent this year, including that one. Is that on um, your runner-up? Uh, no, but, okay. but, uh, but all the ones that are, okay. you know, just kind of got above it, you know. Do you uh, think that was one of your favorite of the big blockbuster mainstreams. Yeah. Um, I liked, Ryan Johnson's an interesting filmmaker. Um, Looper was another you know, really oh, yeah. interesting movie which he made. Uh, and he's having to work within this uh, franchise, which I think kind of blunts his creativity a little bit. But uh, I liked how he was pushing and pulling with the franchise material there and doing something a little bit interesting, something that infuriated a lot of fans. Uh, he said, you know, get your hands off my my Star Wars and my beloved heroes, but uh, that was what was best about it, I think. Um, a lot of it was kind of boilerplate, um, you know, space dogfights and lightsaber battles. And I thought, not, I won't say any spoilers, but I uh, really liked the ending. Yeah, the ending was moving. the strongest part yeah. of the film, I think, the last kind of 20 minutes. It doesn't all work, it's but... It's long. It's I long, I feel like it was yeah. a little too long. Yeah, yeah, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> but on the whole, I think it was a success. Yeah. Um, and I'm a little afraid that the franchise is going back to J.J. Abrams because this was an improvement over The Force Awakens, I think. Uh, so we'll see if the third part lives up to the second part. You were noticing, Carla, on the Heroes list that it's all women this year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I made a little bit of a statement. <laughs> I, I made... Uh, all women heroes and all male villains, which is not to say that all men are bad and all women are good, but it was kind of a year of the woman mm -hmm. uh, socially and politically. Um, Feminism was the dictionary year of the word. Yeah, word and the year, as I was making the list, uh, the women were leaping out at me first, and so I thought, well, I, maybe I'll just kind of keep that focus. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about Sally Hawkins. In the Shape of Water. Yeah, The Shape of Water is really, like Star Wars, you know, another very entertaining movie. Um, it's a kind of genre movie, uh, science fiction, uh, with a little bit of horror to it. Uh, and Sally Hawkins is the heart of that movie. She plays a, a mute woman with a heart of gold who falls in love with a, basically the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> uh, so yeah, she was really terrific in that movie. Um, Wonder Woman, of course, came out this year and Stole the Thunder of Justice League, which was not a very good movie, but Wonder Woman was really well-received, kind of saved the uh, DC universe uh, from total ruin. But I noticed Justice League stayed in theaters for a really long time. Yeah, these movies even, I think a lot of times when they're deemed disappointments, it's more because of the perception of how they were received, uh -huh. not so much like how, how many people went to see them. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, it did make, of course, a... I mean, all, all these movies do. They're kind of preordained to make a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes they go, yeah, but everybody's grumbling about it. So, you know, we know we kind of need to step do something up. different yeah. or step up our game. Yeah. What's your outlook for 2018? Uh, I haven't even been able to think that far <laughs> ahead yet. Really. How about Oscar predictions? You were, oh, Oscar you had predictions, Moonlight right. On the top of your list last year. Yeah. Um, yeah, this year, I don't know, it's kind of hard to say. There's, it, the field is largely split. Um, there's a lot of movies that can, you can probably assume are going to get into the best picture category, even ones that aren't likely to win, I think, like Spielberg has a movie this year, The Post, um, that's also kind of politically timely. 
uh, about journalism and uh, making sure journalism journalists have the ability to speak their mind. Um, there's also uh, Phantom Thread, which has it's touted as having the last uh, Daniel Day Lewis performance. He's uh, purportedly retiring. Um, it's a Paul Thomas Anderson film. Um, um, yeah, The Disaster Artist with James Franco, local our local boy. Yeah. Local, uh, boy. local boys, rather. Yeah, local boys, right? <laughs> There's the Franco brothers, both star in it, and James directed it. Uh, that will probably get some Oscar love, I would think, yeah. particularly for Franco. Uh, Call Me By Your Name will most likely be nominated in a lot of the major categories. Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's been a year of a lot of good films, but uh, not necessarily a lot of consensus about what were the greatest films. Um, so we'll see. Anything else you want to add? Um, hmm. Let's see. Well, there were uh, just always a lot of great documentary films. Um, some made my runners-up list, like Ex Libris is uh, another movie probably not a lot of people saw. It's by Frederick Wiseman, and every year he puts out these roughly three-hour-long documentaries that are these deep dives on, uh, on a subject. Uh, and this one's about the New York Public Library and that whole public library system. And by doing that, he kind of also paints a portrait of life in New York City and all the people who pass through the library system, some of whom are there for special programs and like looking for jobs. And uh, they show the lecture series that the library hosts and all that kind of stuff. So that was a really interesting movie. Um, Dolores, about Dolores Huerta, was another great documentary film this year. Chasing Coral, which is on Netflix, uh, is it one of the stronger movies about global climate change and why we all should be very depressed about that. Uh, so yeah, there's always a lot of good documentary films. Great. Well, thanks again for being here and sure. you know sharing your insights. Um, um, to that, catch up on. Yeah. <laughs> So that wraps up today's Behind the Headlines. If you liked what you heard, click to subscribe. Um, if you want to know what's going on in Palo Alto, go to paloaltoonline.com or follow us on social media. See you next week.